Yeah, good afternoon now. I think we're going to get started with our learning session here. So um, do, we, do we have this? Yeah, there. We're going to get started with our learning session. Uh, so thank you for attending the Lunch and Innovation um, Workshop today. We're going to be talking about the emerging regulatory environment for marketplace lending. I'm Tony Hadley. I'm with Experian. We appreciate your attending today. And we've got quite a few good experts here that I'm going to introduce in just a minute. So um, we're pleased to uh, sponsor this and give you an overview of what's happening in the regulatory environment. And it's not news to anyone. The uh, size and scope and scale and growth of the industry, um, then it's no surprise that regulators are taking a look. They're beginning to be curious about the marketplace lending uh, industry and would like to know more about it, to see what gaps needed to be filled, if any, and how to move forward. Interestingly enough, I was telling my colleagues here, I just got back from a 10-day trip to Asia in, um, with the People's Bank of China, the Reserve Bank of India, and some other central bank regulators in um, Hong Kong. I guess what they're talking about, too, marketplace lending. Exactly the same issues that we're going to be talking about today. Um, right now, uh, regulators here and there seem to be withholding a lot of judgment about how they want to move forward. Right now, they're just trying to figure out what's going on in the industry. We saw a volley across the line um, a few months ago when Treasury issued its request for information about the industry. Several responses there. Uh, I, just last week, one of the um, leaders at uh, the Treasury summarized some of the comments said that, that what they'd really like to see is more transparency in the industry. They'd like to know how it's working. They noted that some uh, in the financial services industry are calling for parity within the lending environment. So that's an issue on their plate. Um, we've seen um, the CFPB weigh in, telling the lenders to be careful about fair lending and other uh, consumer protections. So there's another point that's been made by regulators. We've seen FTC and the state AGs talk about lead gen and how information is being collected and used in the marketing of online uh, lending products and services. And then just last week we saw Congress begin to get interested with letters to the SBA and the Treasury asking for them to report back to them about what's happening in the online industry and, and where Congress may need to go in the future to fill gaps. So we got a lot of interest among regulators about the industry, uh, what I'd call right now more talk and less action, and hopefully we'll keep it that way. We'll just talk about it, right? Um, we've also uh, seen the industry respond, um, trying to be proactive. For example, we've got the Online Lenders Alliance and the Responsible Business Lending Coalition advocating for greater self-regulation and improved business practices. That's a good move. And then we saw earlier this week uh, some, of the, some in the fine tech industry begin a new coalition. Uh, financial Innovation Now, some of the big platforms, the internet platforms, who seeks to agu uh, uh, advocate for regulatory policies that promote innovation and not a stifling, overburdensome regulatory approach in this industry. That's good. So against this swirling background of conversation, uh, we could see some uncertainty. It's something we should note. Anybody that's investing or in the industry needs to understand the regulatory environment and how it's merging, and that's why we have our panel here. Here's the questions we're going to address today. How do we define the online marketplace lending environment? What types of consumers and businesses do they serve? How are federal, state regulators reviewing this nascent uh, market segment? What industry self-regulations have on the online lenders? What do we put in place there? And how are these entities using big data for underwriting and other uh, marketing purposes? So to help us address these issues, I've got my panelists here. Joe DiPaolo on the far right, Chairman, CEO, and founder of College Avenue Student Loans. Uh, Joe and his team founded College Avenue in August 2014 and set out to make borrowing for college uh, simple, clear, and personalized. Um, Connor French is the next one. 
Uh, he's responsible for U.S. legal and regulatory affairs at Funding Circle, leading global marketplace for small business loans. Before joining Funding Circle, he served as CEO of Indigo Africa, uh, which is a social enterprise and lifestyle brand that supports artists and women through economic empowerment and education. And then we have Andrew Smith, a partner at Covington and Burling in Washington, D.C. So Mr. Smith counsels banks, non-banks, credit bureaus, and financial technology providers regarding compliance with consumer financial laws and rules, including UDAP and CFPB. And he is uh, counsel for the Online Lending Alliance. So he's got a lot of real good insight into the industry. Gentlemen, thank you for participating in today's uh, panel. Really appreciate it. We've got some experts here. So I'm going to just start it off by asking first Joe and then Connor how you would best define the marketplace lending industry segment from your perspective as a small business and a consumer lending in the sp lender in the space. Joe, would you kick that off? Um, thanks, Tony. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here as well. Um, I see the I see the marketplace lending as basically meeting consumer demand, certainly on the consumer loan side. Um, where traditional institutions have um, do not play, and and potentially they don't play because of capital requirements in, in the post Dodd Frank era. Perhaps they don't play because of cons other constraints or prioritizations, or even or even legislation and regulation that has changed the playing field. Um, so there's huge huge segments of the market where marketplace lenders have come in. I think you know obviously the the biggest one of the biggest headliners are the are the personal loan categories like Lending Club and Prosper, um, Avant, uh, Marlette, and you know that category um, has shown a lot of innovation. Very uh, very talented um, companies in that category, but but greatly assisted by the fact that the Card Act made made borrowing on a credit card through a balance transfer much less attractive to an issuer. Because you couldn't reprice that asset anymore post the card act, so so the so credit card companies have somewhat ceded a big portion of what they used to do as as debt consolidators. Um, so so that's an example of a place where where clearly the regulatory environment changed the playing field, and it wasn't necessarily related to capital or funding. Um, but you could see the same thing in other markets as well. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm not going to pick a fight with Joe on question one. Uh, I view marketplace lending as uh, sort of efficiently uh, matching uh, capital supply with, with borrowing demand, whether it's, you know, in the consumer or the small business context. Um, you know, I think that originally it was, it was born as, as peer to peer lending in a lot of respects, um, and that sort of reflected uh, early on that there wasn't much institutional appetite for the, for the asset class. And so, uh, platforms like Funding Circle in the UK um, and then Prosper and Lending Club here had to rely on retail investment uh, to fund their initial loans, but sort of as the industry's grown and, and in size and in the sort of different variants, uh, the concept of marketplace lending is intended, I think, to encapsulate quite a few, uh, quite a few more different types of models. Okay, thanks, guys. Now, Andrew, um, why don't you uh, take their definitions and see if there's any way that the regulators are viewing the industry that might be uh, different or in complement to the way they've described it. Right. Well, <clears throat> the Treasury Department in their request for information um, really defined it about as broadly as one could imagine. They say, well, it involves these online platforms that we all know so well, like Lending Club and Prosper and SoFi. Um, but it also could include balance sheet lenders. Say, well, what's that? Well, that's someone who loans money and keeps it in their portfolio. In other words, a lender, you know, any kind of lender. Um, it could include a bank-affiliated lender, again, something that we've known for years and years, um, where, you co where a bank <coughs> partners with a non-bank in order to extend credit to consumers or to small businesses, typically consumers. That's a powerful model because banks are able, <clears throat> banks don't need to be concerned about state licensing and usury laws. They're able to rely on the laws of their home jurisdiction when they make loans to consumers. So that allows you to build a nationwide platform fairly easily 
uh, as opposed to having to get licensed or comply with the laws of, of 50 different states and the differing uh, usury requirements and the like. So we have bank-affiliated lenders, says the Treasury Department, and those might be portfolio lenders again. You know, maybe the bank keeps it in its portfolio or, or the bank sells it to the secondary market or the bank sells it to its, its non-bank partner or they securitize the loans. Again, these are, the thing, these are things that have been uh, done for generations. Um, and they also say, you know, and it's not only consumer loans, it also could be small business loans, it might be installment loans, it might be lines of credit, it might be you know, open-end that revolves. So the products, the sky's the limit. Um, so the one takeaway from that, for me, is that marketplace lending to the regulators means online. That's pretty much it. Now, <clears throat> marketed online, originated online, serviced and collected online through an electronic environment, not face-to-face. -face. Um, and I think that's how they're defining it. Now, they did leave a couple of things out. Uh, last week at the FTC's lead generation workshop, which we may talk about a bit, um, there was a fellow from Lending Tree on one of the panels, and he said, no, we're the marketplace lenders. We're a marketplace. And he's right. They are a marketplace. Credit Karma is a marketplace. Consumers go there, and they shop. That's a marketplace. That's marketplace lending. The one thing, curiously, that Treasury omitted from its RFI is small-dollar, short-term lending, um, which, and those guys are the original online lenders, and they omitted that because the CFPB has a rulemaking out that's going to regulate that market potentially in a fairly pervasive way. So Treasury said, look, we don't want comments on that. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about these newfangled lending club people. Um, <clears throat> so really broad in many ways, not broad enough in other ways. Right, and, and somewhat of a blurred line there I can see too. So um, Connor, um, w would you just briefly describe from your point of view what kinds of products and services are being provided to the small business uh, entrepreneurs through online, uh, through marketplace lending? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just to follow up on Andrew's point, you know, by way of sort of education, for anyone in the room, I believe if you want to understand how any particular marketplace lender is regulated, you can simply look at what are their lending activities and how are they forming capital. And based on those two things, you're going to see which sort of traditional regulatory structure that they're, that they're um, operating in. Um, you know, for us, obviously, that, that'd be business lending. Um, the sort of power and potential we feel like for small business lending actually doesn't, isn't just some sort of reaction to tightening of credit after the financial crisis. These are 20 to 30 year sort of structural factors that have led to a highly underbanked population here in the United States in a very fragmented sort of lending environment that, that small businesses experience. Um, that sort of issue that was there, as you see, you know, we went from, I think, Someone said earlier in the conference there were actually 20,000 banks at some point. Uh, and now there are 7,000, six or 7,000. Um, and the disappearance has been of the community banks that were sort of the, doing this bread and butter lending that, that small businesses needed. That has, was sort of exacerbated by the financial crisis. And I think the latest I saw is that small business lending is still 18% or so down from what it was in 2008. And so we, what we see are banks that are unable to make a certain type of loan uh, you know, we lend between 25000 and 500000 because it's not profitable. With their processes, it takes the same amount of time to underwrite that $250,000 loan as it does to underwrite a $2.5 million loan where they're getting many more fees. And so with us bringing sort of tech-enabled processes, we can help provide that sort of layer of credit. You can think of it as a bank replacement product to these entrepreneurs and innovators that are sort of the, the beating heart of the American economy. Yeah, well, thanks, Connor. Um, so, Joe, um, how does that compare to consumer lending in the marketplace, and what kinds of products and services are consumers getting from, uh, from, the, from the industry? Well, actually, there's a, a lot of similarity uh, to what Connor said. So um, I, I would actually point to uh, the, uh, the, the refi players who are refining student loan debt. It's not really our business. Our business is providing loans to, to students as they go to college. Um, but the refi players came out and created products to refinance federal loans. And you really have to look at federal loans as, you know, $1.2 trillion of mispriced assets. They're not supposed to be priced, right, because they're, they're, they're granted to students without a credit check. And you don't know what that kid's going to look like 10 years later. So in essence, 
you know, SoFi and Common Bond went in and, and created a product and created a set of products that no established players were providing. Um, so that, that's, a, that's basically a product set that didn't even exist. Um, so that's, that's the clearest example. Um, in our case, we are, we're an in-school lender. So we saw it a little differently. We saw that um, for the most part, there was a one-size-fits-all mentality. You, you know, it didn't matter whether you were in a one-year program or a four-year program. It doesn't matter whether you're undergrad or you're grad. The student loan was a was a 15 year loan that was deferred, and that's what it was. And and it didn't matter what your profile was or, or what customer you were. We thought that was a big opportunity to pro provide you know product differentiation, um, and and like many of the other lenders, we also thought there was an opportunity for a better customer experience. Well, that sounds like innovation to me, Joe. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> hey, um, Andrew, I wanted to get your opinion on a um, a case that many people are looking at and viewing and watching closely, it's Madden versus Midland. Uh, what are your thoughts about that in terms of how online lenders are going to have to deal with this conflicting and overlapping uh, state usury laws? Right, so I will say, I'll give a shout out to the good people at Pepper Hamilton who on our chairs left a description of some of the hot issues in the industry and they had a nice blurb on Madden versus Midland funding which is a good introduction to the case. This is a case where um, FIA, uh, the former MBNA, now, now Bank of America, um, sold credit card receivables to, Mid to Midland Funding, which was it's owned by Encore, which is the biggest debt collector in the world, publicly traded. These are really big, responsible companies. Um, and Encore went out and tried to collect the debt against an individual who lives in the state of New York, and the, um, and the individual argued, hey, you're collecting a debt that violates New York state law. And the lender said, but it was made by Bank of America, a national bank. They don't have to comply with state law. Um, and and the, the, the individual said, yeah, but you're not Bank of America. Um, you're Midland Funding. You're not, you're not a national bank. You don't get to export your interest rates and fees and, and other aspects of your operations to other states. Um, and surprisingly enough, the Second Circuit agreed. So people think there are all kinds of things to hate about this case, all kinds of reasons why the court, people think the court got it wrong. Um, one of the big ones is because if a loan is valid at its inception, if a loan was valid when made by Bank of America, it should continue to be valid throughout the chain of custody. A lot of arguments like that. I think folks hope that Madden is an outlier. Um, but if you talk to people in this industry, they say, this is the Second Circuit. You know, the Second Circuit is the mo it's New York, uh, New York, Connecticut, Vermont, this is, the, this is the most important business court in America. The Second Circuit doesn't get these things wrong. On a petition for rehearing, the Second Circuit said, no, we're not going to rehear this. We got it right the first time around. So arguments have been made. There will be a Supreme Court cert petition, um, almost certainly. And you know who knows if the Supreme Court grants cert or not. I would say, though, that putting aside the Madden case, there's another line of cases, whether or not Madden's an outlier. There's another line of cases referred to commonly as the true lender cases, and this goes back a long time. Think about these bar bank partnerships again that I was talking about earlier, where you have a situation where a bank partners with a non-bank who's internet savvy, who understands how to market and originate loans on the internet. This company markets the loans for the bank. This company uh, does all the heavy lifting in terms of the underwriting and origination. The bank makes the final credit decision and the bank funds the loan, but the partner does just about everything else. Then, on the back end, the bank keeps the loan on its books for a day or two or three and then sells it, maybe back to the bank partner, who then securitizes it or holds it in its own portfolio or sells it to somebody else. It's a pretty common uh, business model, and over the years, that business model has been challenged. And the and state attorneys general, one of the first cases, at least to, to, uh, that I'm aware of, was a case 15 or 20 years ago against a bank in Delaware. Um, the attorney general of the state of New York sued uh, this non-bank lender who was partnering with the bank and said, hey, County Bank of Rehoboth, Delaware, they're not the real lender. You, non-bank, who happen to be a payday lender, you, payday lender, you're the real lender, and you're violating New York state law. And in fact, 
the bank and the, and the lender lost that case. There have been other cases that have been decided differently, but these true lender cases are nothing new. There are true lender cases being litigated right now. And I think that it, Madden just reminds us of the importance of carefully structuring these relationships with banks and understanding what all of your options are if you're going to wind up holding the paper at the end of the day. Yeah, good point. Uh, Connor, now you're an in-house attorney. Uh, what, how do you see it, if, if anything, differently? Then? So this has been an, an odd one for me because we actually at Funding Circle uh, opted to do a direct lending model, um, which... I think was probably more radical at the time, but also has a lot to do with the fact that we're doing commercial lending. So there's a little easier way that you can have a nationwide footprint without uh, an issuing bank partner. Um, however, uh, a day does not go by where an investor doesn't call me and ask me about <laughs> Madden. So it, it, that in actually includes our board of directors. So I've had to learn a lot, a lot about it. Um, and you know, there's. I guess what I would add is that <clears throat> marketplace lending is. You know, it, it certainly affects some of the models here, but that's that's sort of the smaller amount of what it would actually affect across the entire sort of financial services sector. Um, if you think about, uh, you know, uh, on Monday, the Federal Reserve, Raj Date, was talking about some of the advantages that banks traditionally had, and one of those is sort of privilege ability to federal preemption, and that goes for all of the secondary markets for bank-originated assets. And so all of those are at risk or perceived as at risk from Madden. So I think there's going to be a lot of attention on that case because it's not really just marketplace lending that's sort of at stake. Um, I also think that if you look at the, the facts of, of Madden, uh, that there's a lot not to like. It's, it's, it could be a case of bad fa facts make bad law. Um, but I think that we all have to be aware in this room that there may be some significant market disruptions sort of in addition to the disruptions of my own life caused by the uncertainty that, uh, that Madden has had. No. Tony, can I make one additional point on Madden? So there has been a lot of talk among lawyers about how do we deal with Madden. Yes, maybe it's an outlier, maybe not. Um, it seems to be some consensus coalescing around the idea that the bank, if you're doing a bank partnership, the bank ought to hold back some of the risk. I don't know how much, 1%, 5%, 10%, I don't know, but, that, but that's the idea. So the bank still has skin in the game. The bank, you can still take advantage of whatever that whatever its home state laws might be. So could be a good idea, but consider for a second the kinds of banks that are engaged in bank partnerships. These are frequently very small banks, $300 million banks, $500 million banks, and you have these big marketplace lenders who are running a couple billion dollars of loans through that bank, and the bank holds back 5%. <coughs> What's that going to do to the bank's balance sheet, to, to the balance sheet of a $250 million bank? So I'm not sure that that's so easy to do in, in reality. Yeah, good. Let's turn to the, uh, another issue, and that is just underwriting and, and credit risk. I think that's an important issue. And I'm going to ask uh, Joe to start that off by just describing some of the underwriting techniques you're using and what kind of uh, credit analysis are you doing. I guess that is both uh, I, authenticating the individual, understanding who they are, verifying their information, and then uh, moving into credit risk. How does it differ? for example, from other routine types of loans that we might see. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, so the student loan product is one of the most misunderstood products and we're, we're one of the most misunderstood industries um, in, in the space. We're really not always making a loan to the student because there's no chance an 18-year-old could take a, a ten twenty thousand dollars obligation and commit to that at that point. Yeah. So we write the loan so somebody could pay it tomorrow morning if the kid doesn't go to school, which means 93% of the time that's written to a co-signer, which is normally a parent or some adult or guardian. Um, the others are grad students, adults, etc. cetera. Um, and if you think about it, this is an unsecured consumer loan. It's what it is. It's an unsecured loan. Um, so, so the, and it's a prime borrower. So the credit box looks identical to credit boxes for credit cards and personal loans. So, if, and I'd spent my, most of my first 15 plus years in credit cards and credit and marketing and other areas. And, the, and basically the approach is very, is very, very similar to the approach those companies take in underwriting loans. And, and, and while there's plenty of data available um, through the credit reporting agencies, um, at the end of the day, 
you're just coming back to the same principles. You know, the, 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 pay, the, the borrower has to have the stability, ability, and willingness to pay. That's the principle. And, and it's, again, it's an unsecured credit decision. So all we need, all we need is we need to be able to positively identify the customer. So that's usually a name, address, social, or date of birth. We need income or some way, some way to derive that they can pay it. And then we need access to the credit bureau. So you really don't have to put the customer through like, like, a, like a really messy, nasty, long process. You get those three pieces of information, and you should be able to give them an answer in a, in a, in a few seconds. Um, and that's kind of how we approach it. And we, we don't try to complicate it with, with mis mysterious uh, uh, algorithms or anything. Oh, good perspective. Thank you. So, uh, Connor, how, how do you pursue the issue of underwriting and uh, credit analysis for uh, commercial entities, small businesses? Uh, so, Tony, I'll, I'll take the bait uh, through partnership with Experian. Uh, they, <laughs> no, they. Uh, we, we, it's, it's a little more. Ch it's a little more challenging to fully automate uh, small business underwriting again for the the twenty five thousand to, to five hundred thousand type of term loan that we're doing. Um, so we rely on sort of a combination of of. Uh, algorithms uh, or you know, risk models that we're constantly refreshing um, and adding new sort of variables, including our own loan book, too, um, as well as manual uh, processes. We've recruited underwriters, uh, seasoned underwriters from community banks across the country so that we have a pretty good idea of what, uh, what small businesses look like on a national level. Uh, you know, this is uh, you know, a moment where I really do think that there are ways that the government could proactively help us. We know, for instance, from the White House that that uh, tax returns for small businesses could be available through an API. I'm not sure what the barriers are to actually releasing that, but that would make a level competitive playing field for these small businesses in seeking credit. It would not necessarily advantage us. It would advantage the experience. Um, in addition, in the UK, there's things called like the company's house where you have to fi do certain filings, um, and that can help with the fraud you know, fraud prevention and other processes. So I'd, I'd like to see um, some activity or, or support from the federal government here in helping us, you know, in the, and others in the provision of, of affordable credit to small businesses. But, you know, to return to the question, it, it really is a combination of, of, uh, of, you know, traditional underwriting variables put into an algorithm as well as uh, a, a underwriting, manual underwriting overlay. I really like that answer. Thank you, Connor. <laughs> That, is that like the, uh, Jeb Bush's warm kiss or what? You know? <laughs> I don't know. Being compared to Jeb Bush right now. You're on the decline. Faint praise. Uh, okay, so Andrew, um, how, how do you think regulators like FTC, CFPB, maybe even the state AGs are viewing the use of big data and big data analytics uh, with respect to assessing credit risk? There's a lot of talk about big data, its uh, use, its application, what, it, what are you seeing the regulators uh, uh, saying about this? So just like I have a hard time defining marketplace lending, I have a hard time defining big data. But I can think of a couple of examples of big data. So for example, demographic data. Data, and that, when I say that, I mean data that doesn't identify me, but maybe data that's about people who look like me, people who are my age or have my income level or live generally where I live. Um, using that kind of demographic data raises all kinds of red flags in terms of for, with respect to fair lending. And um, I think that it would be hard to find a fair lending lawyer who would bless the use of that data, at least to make credit decisions, maybe include it in a waterfall, you know, put, send some people to one application process versus another application process as a result of this demographic data. But the, I'm, I think that the, that the regulators are, are focused on that. You know, there was, there was a reverse redlining case the other day from the ECOA, um, which is making decisions based on where people live. And, and that's, that's always going to be, that's always going to attract regulatory attention. The other kind of big data that people are talking about is what I'll refer to as non-traditional data. So data, data points that we don't, that we never knew were predictive before. Um, one of my favorite examples is the number of friends you have on Facebook. Well, in fact, the number of friends you have on Facebook is probably really predictive because it's predictive of the stability factor that Joe was talking about. You have a lot of friends. You've been on Facebook for a while. You have roots in the community, some community. Um, that's predictive of creditworthiness. 
but does it discriminate against people on, an, on a prohibited basis? So, for example, does it discriminate against people like me who are 50 years old who don't have any Facebook presence at all? Um, the other thing that's really interesting about this is what I will refer to as palatability. So even if you can get comfortable with the fact that this information is not, even if you can get comfortable with the fact that the use of this information does not discriminate against people on a prohibited basis, based on their race, on their age, on their national origin, things like this, um, even, if you, even if you can get comfortable with that, how do you explain that to consumers? So when you deny a consumer credit, mm -hmm. you're going to have to, or for that matter, a business, right? you're going to have to provide an adverse action notice. And in that adverse action notice, you're going to have to say why you denied them, the fo and four reasons why you denied them. And if one of those reasons is you don't have enough friends on Facebook, that's a hard sell. And so what people have found, I think, what some people have found is that, yes, this data can be predictive. Yes, it may be able to be used in a manner that is consistent with fair lending principles, but there's this palatability factor, and that that has discouraged uptake from this. So I do think that regulators, however, are going to be focused on this. One other quick final point is that not only do you have to be worried about fair lending, you also have to be worried about data use. So number of friends on Facebook, do the Facebook terms and conditions allow you to use the data in that manner? Facebook and other data vendors are going to be very sensitive to the fact that they do not want to become consumer reporting agencies. Experian has invited that and provides the data in a format um, and provides these predictive variables that are tried and true. So I think that that has a lot of appeal, at least it would for me if I were starting up a lender now. Yeah, thank you. Andrew, uh, that sounds like a good uh, application of consumer lending, but is, is, is commercial lending or business lending different when it comes to big data or social media? Because we no, don't have no, you know, ECOA factor. And what I what I wanted to well, so we're we're one of the sort of federal regimes that's equally applicable to commercial as well as consumer is is fair lending. So um, we're aware of you know of those sort of considerations. You know, I, I would say that another example of what Andrew Andrew was talking about is that um, you know w with ninety five percent accuracy, you can predict someone's ethnicity based on their Facebook feed. And so that allows variables to creep in, such as race and, and very prohibited factors. And it just shows you a little bit that uh, just because something is an algorithm does not mean it doesn't discriminate if the architects of that algorithm are, are sort of outsmarting the, the law. Um, so I think it is a gray area. I, I was very encouraged, actually, from conversations with several regulators, as, as well as Treasury, that that they're concerned, actually, that people are so cautious around fair lending because you don't know what might have a disparate impact, that they're worried that that might stifle innovation. So I think there is some thinking around sort of how can we start to look at some new m models that may be compliant with fair lending but give people a little bit more runway to pilot that so that we see the true innovation in reaching sort of consumers that, in, in small businesses that I don't think we've fully seen yet on the, on the customer acquisition side from borrowers. Oh, thank you. Joe, do you have anything to add uh, to that issue? No, I think the I think the comments made um, by Andrew and Connor would be very consistent with with my view. I mean, I I think if you wanted to use data, you know, the da again a consumer credit decision. There's so much information available through the reporting agencies that, and and the majority of information in the credit file isn't even used. So so before I went to something like friends on Facebook, and I'm not on Facebook either, so I guess I wouldn't get approved. Um, the um, I would look at other data sources, like if you if you want to access, you know, a checking account, you know, yeah. files and so forth. Um, and and if you and if you ever went to something that was clearly not related to how you pay your bills, which kind of seems to make sense when you're making credit decisions, I, I would never. I, well, let me put it this way: no investor who's given me money would let me make a credit decision based on that without sort of the more fundamental credit information that's available. So I would. I would run it as a as a as a backdrop test and, and validate it before I ever let a credit decision out of the shop. That's a good practice. Let me turn to uh, another issue here that I think is important. I'm going to ask uh, Andrew to lead it, and that is, I don't know. There's there's this perception that the uh, marketplace lending industry isn't regulated. I don't know where that comes from. So I want I want Andrew to set out. The current regulatory structure for online lending, not not the prospective one with rules and 
talk by regulators about how they want to move forward, but the way it is right now, Andrew, would you talk about that? Sure. I mean, if you are making loans to consumers in the United States, that's a very heavy, heavily regulated business. Heavily regulated at the federal level, also heavily regulated at the state level. And if you're making loans to small businesses, that also is regulated somewhat less heavily. But as Connor said, um, fair lending requirements, for example, will apply to you. There may be some state laws involving, there may be some state licensing requirements and state interest rate limits and, and some state regulation of the actual terms of the loan. Um, so, you know, this idea of un lack of regulation, at least from a consumer or from a borrower protection standpoint, is baffling to me because we have loans that date back to the 1960s that are tried and true. The Truth in Lending Act, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Electronic Funds Transfer Act, um, and I could go on and on. And don't get me started on real estate secured credit, which is just a morass of regulation. So, uh, Tony, I mean, I think we could talk a long time about the regulatory scheme, but, um, but suffice to say that I, from my perspective, um, where I where I practice, there's th these, these products are heavily regulated to protect the borrowers, consumers, and small businesses. Okay, good. Uh, Connor, do you want to talk about a few that you have to be mindful of as uh, in the small business space? Uh, yeah, sure. sure. And, uh, you know, I think this was, uh, this question sort of was one of my, my personal crusades. And if anyone wants to look at a Funding Circle's response to the RFI, it's the, you know, the first question, which is, you know, I, I fundamentally disagree with the assumption that marketplace lending is some sort of regulatory arbitrage. We are, we are subject to an enormous number of regulations, again, based on our lending activities and the types of investors or the, the ways that we're forming capital. Um, on the, the lending side, you know, it is a, a, a bit lighter in regulation than consumer lending. Um, but as a direct lender, for instance, we are uh, subject to all of the state licensing and, and usury laws. Now, again, many states don't have a usury uh, or rate cap for um, small business lending, but, but many do. And believe me, I mean, the lattice work of state laws are, are not very uniformly written and are incredibly hard sometimes to figure out how you even calculate what the rate cap would be. Um, so we end up, I think, overly conservative sometimes in the way that we're, we're calculating it. Um, you know, there are federal, some federal protections, you know, the FCRA, uh, ECOA are, are probably some of the bigger ones, uh, you know, as well as a lot of the um, any money, money laundering laws that are on, on both sides of our business, uh, you know, another area where uh, where we, we've tried to automate a, a lot. Um, on the investor side, that's another sort of interesting one if you look at the history of marketplace lending, because it really started with the SEC as the regulator, because all of these initial platforms were offering uh, borrower payment dependent notes that were deemed securities. And in fact, Prosper was briefly shut down by the SEC. Uh, and so as the ways in which the capital formation changed, the SEC seems to have taken a, you know, less of an aggress aggressive stance as being the primary regulator, and you're seeing more about the CFPB and more on the borrower side. And so it's really been a fundamental shift in the dialogue um, in terms of when I'm talking to people about it. People are much more interested now on the, on the lending side than on the capital formation side, whereas I think if you went back five years, you'd have the absolute opposite. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Joe... Anything to add to that uh, from a consumer lending perspective, what's top of mind with you or, or where this perception comes from that the industry is not regulated? Well, I think Andrew captured it very well in terms of well, we are very regulated. Um, the way we see, our, we, do, we do, though, see a little bit of an advantage versus a traditionally regulated bank. Um, and, and we see the advantage in that. We, we kind of, you know, we use a bank sponsor to to uh, to book our loans, and we see it as we feel we we run ourselves like we're a department or a product line within a bank. That's our structure, and so we 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 observe all of the rules of of that have been you know um, commented on um, by Andrew and Connor. Um, what we don't have is we don't have the we don't have um, the broader you know we don't have to do some of the broader banking requirements like the bank secrecy all, all of those rules that apply because you're a bank depository and we don't have to do all the capital ratios and the tier one and we don't go through all those and, and that creates a lot of bureaucracy that creates a lot of time 
I'm not saying it's not. I don't understand why the regulators ask for it. I mean, they are insuring your deposit. So, um, but but that whole part of the business is what you can avoid, um, and that that's makes on the prudential side. Then is what you're. Describing. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That makes the business a lot easier to run because yeah. you don't have to. St- I mean, you don't have to stop everything you do to run through all these checkpoints that really don't make the product any better for the customer. Good. So that. Um, I think that's a good segue into our final top topic, and uh, I'd like you to um, lead this, Connor, and that is, Joe says there is this flexibility, especially in the prudential way, that uh, gives a little bit of a gap, and so, good. Uh, I'd like you to talk about um, some of the new self-regulatory and improved business practices that are being discussed in the um, industry, kind of as a self uh and proactive way of doing business because uh, I, I think it's your company that funding circle that helped found this uh, this uh, so-called uh, small business borrowers bill of rights so would you describe that what you're trying to achieve there what it is and how it's moving forward sure and and for for those who who aren't aware of it a uh, uh, sort of coalition of uh, of for-profit nonprofit lenders and small business advocates uh, worked together uh, over the past, you know, six or, or eight months uh, to put together, so, sort of to try to put the the, um, the borrower back at the center of conversation about the type of lending we were doing, and to tr- enumerate certain rights that we thought that uh, small businesses deserved and small business owners deserved in seeking and obtaining credit. Um, and and you know, we worked with everyone from from Axion and Opportunity Fund. Uh, to, to Lending Club was the other marketplace lender involved in small business majority and, and advocacy group. Um, you know, what we were to divide up the way that we're regulated, for instance, in the UK, you have very, you have sort of conduct risk and you have prudential risk. And, you know, in the UK, the Financial Conduct Authority handles one and the PRA handles handles the other. And we, we fundamentally believe and don't object to any um, any sort of requirements around our conduct, the way that we serve our customers. And we wanted to show that by going above and beyond what is required by law to take away any fuzziness there and to really create a choice architecture for small business owners when they're seeking credit. Small business owners are consumers fundamentally, and they need to be able to understand and make apples to apples comparisons when they're offered credit. So if they're, you know, so a lot of the, the, borrower bill of rights was around transparency and fairness and making sure that you had to, you know, articulate a, a, an annualized interest rate, uh, that you had no hidden charges, that you didn't, that you disclosed any sort of prepayment penalties effectively. A lot of people um, have a fixed repayment amount, and then if you repay early, offer you a 25% discount, as if that's, you know, that's saving you money, but really they're, they're, not, they're not allowing you to get out of a highly priced loan, um, and they're giving you no reward for paying early. So we're trying to promote these sort of uniform practices. Um, I also feel, you know, that there's, uh, you know, you could feel it in the Treasury RFI that there is a fear that of, of what, what's the potential impact of bad actors in the space. And we feel like by raising the bar and coming together um, with a wide group of people and encouraging others to come to that standard, that we effectively begin to prevent the likelihood of, of those bad actors or um, can point to people who are outside of, of these standards and say, you know what, that's why this conduct is offered. That's why that people are having these experiences. So we're, you know, we're, we're still in the process of figuring out, um, you know, a, a governance structure and, 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 and how we were going to monitor that. But for the time being, to make sure we got something out there for people, we just asked the chief executive officer of each company to put a publicly available attestation to all of the different practices um, to at least threaten the reputational risk of, of key players in the industry if they uh, if they are not abiding by practices we think are fundamentally um, critical to small business lending. Yeah, good. Uh, well, I commend you for that. I know Experian itself has quite a bit of um, experience in self-regulation, particularly in marketing services. Um, and it's gone a long way uh, to putting out best practices and enforceable code of conduct through our trade group and helping to limit uh, a lot of regulation in that area, not all of it. But um, it gives us flexibility to keep improving our businesses and avoiding regulation. So I'd just like to ask Andrew, how do you think the regulators think of self-regulation in this perspective? 
Um, do you think that they're buying the idea as a good one? And what do you think the future is of it, Andrew? Uh, well, I think that regulators are big fans of self-regulation. They always say that they are. There are several successful self-regulatory schemes. The one that comes to mind is the National Advertising Division at the BBB, which has real teeth. You know, they, ha they have arbitration, you know, they have processes where you can complain. They have little mini trials. They make decisions about whether or not an ad is fair or not. Um, so regulators like it, but there is some suspicion. So as an example, um, there has always been suspicion of, of uh, trade association or, or uh, best practices with respect to certain advertising, like s seals of approval. This product is green. You know, this product is environmentally conscious. Well, what does that mean? It means something different to all of us. So we have to be very, very clear about what it is that our best practices stand for and what it means when we adhere to them. Um, as a general perspective, I think that they want to see best practices that are not just window dressing. You put the seal on, you put the borrower bill of rights on your website, but then you, in fact, don't adhere to them, and there's no back, there's no back end policing of that. Um, and I think that you know, the be with best practices, frequently when you adhere to a voluntary code of conduct, you could be putting yourself at a competitive disadvantage because now you're no longer able to engage in conduct that your competitors are. Um, and so that's why that policing on the back end is, is, particularly, is particularly important for the regulators. So they will tell you publicly they love self-regulation. They will tell you privately that, this, that a self-regulatory scheme is only as good as, the, as, as its teeth. Certainly far more than just words. I agree with you. So um, we're almost out of time. We might have time for one or two questions. Does anybody want to stump the panel? Yeah. So we can put more of the takeaways from the two days that there is no risk of arbitrage. Sorry to bring this up one more time, but we're trying to reconcile between that that point of view and I hate to speak for the banks, but but I don't think the banks would be willing to take, for example, for the undergraduate schools that we went to and bring it into the undergrad. That'd be correct. I think they wouldn't do it I'll take the I'll take the example you gave. Um, we don't use that, the the one you just said. So because we know better, and that would that would not go well at all. Um, and we might feel we're unregulated for a little bit of time, but somebody's going to find us eventually, or our bank sponsor is going to kick us out. Right. So um, I I I just don't I just don't think you just don't follow the law, the rules. I mean there are I mean I do think you have to think of yourself as regulated. You just, the difference is you just don't have to conform to an entire set of rules and processes, some of which don't apply to you because it's not your business model. That's really the difference, at least from the perspective of a consumer lender. Because I've been in banks almost all my life. That's why I have gray hair. And, and, it's, and it's, just, it's just you have to check every box. And, that's a, and, and you have a board of directors who, you know, call you in 12 times a year and you go through with them 12 times a year. So you spend, you spend an incredible amount of your time going through processes that have zero benefit to the consumer other than ultimately protecting them from some harm. And so that the problem really, the real advantage, I'll just say the real advantage is, is and I could say this in, you know, where I live today, and I, I, I've done a startup once before, in, in, in more of the entrepreneurial businesses, you spend 95% of your time thinking about how to improve value to the customer. As you get into larger companies and more regulated institutions, highly regulated, you spend 95% of your time going through processes that have zero impact on the customer. And it's just, it's just the way it is. And so, but you're not, it's not because you're not living by the laws. Andrew, yeah. you wanted to jump in. Oh, just you? yeah, really quickly, with respect to the, your, your hypothetical, where you went to school, using that, that's your secret sauce. That's, you, that's what helps you cut f credit risk better than anybody else. You know, maybe that's okay from a fair lending perspective, but once you reach scale, 
you're not going to be able to, you know, maybe the regulators don't know about you now, and that's why you've never gotten any questions. But once you reach scale, you're not going to be able to rely on that. And here's the other thing that happens. Once you go to your, say, your Series B financing, and you have investors coming in who are sophisticated about these issues, and they say, what, you make credit decisions based on where someone went to school? Do you have an opinion from someone knowledgeable in the field that that doesn't discriminate on a prohibited basis? And, and if you don't, that might be the end of the financing round. And so you find, I, I see every so often, companies that are being evaluated for one of these investments, and they have a really just a fatal flaw in their business model. Um, something, you know, they're using data, they, they have to use data that they are prohibited for, by contract from using in the manner that they're using it. Those types of, those types of issues, and you say, well, this can't persist. Maybe it can persist because you're small enough and no one's paying attention to you, but there's no way that I can invest $100 million in that company. A concluding <clears throat> yeah. comment from you. Oh. <laughs> Very quickly. I mean, uh, these sort of novel, quirky, underwriting attributes, they make great business insider headlines. They don't make real credit decisions. I mean, none of those players, any player that claims that they're underwriting a consumer loan based on like the Yelp reviews are, are doing FICO score. They just want publicity. I, I promise you that's the case. Okay, very good. Hey, listen, we're out of time. Would you give these guys a round of applause? Thank you. So, that's a good comment. So, so like that.